All right, everybody, welcome to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. I am your host, Adam Messer, and this is the Adam Messer Show. My guest today is going to be P.A. Duncan, and uh, P.A. Duncan is an author and an editor, um, and this is a, just a really neat little um, bio that she sent me. Belgrade to London, Prague to Paris, P.A. Duncan writes gritty espionage with a hint of romance. So uh, we're going to take a moment of silence <clears throat> right now, though, uh, for one of our um, our friends who has passed away, uh, Sandy Batiste. Uh, you might have known her for the One Human Nation. And um, she, unfortunately, she passed away this week. They had her funeral yesterday. So we're going to take a moment of silence uh, now to uh, to remember Sandy. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we just wanted to take a moment of silence to uh, to remember Sandy and to uh, think about her and her family in this uh, time of need. And uh, Sandy was always a wonderful person. Um, always came up with uh, interesting dialogues about um, you know just the human condition and and how we can do better as people. So we love you, Sandy. <clears throat> All right. So everybody, uh, like I said, my guest today is uh, P. A. Duncan. Um, she actually goes by Maggie. So, Maggie, welcome to uh, the Adam Mister Show. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, uh, do you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself? Well, um, my longer bio explains that I'm a retired bureaucrat with an overactive imagination. And uh, I did work for Uncle Sam for more than 30 years and retired to write for myself instead of for uncle sam everything i wrote for him was his and i wanted to write for me so mm, okay. i've been retired for several years now and writing for myself oh that's awesome all right uh so sandy one of the parts of uh, my show that i do is uh sebastian messer that's my son he is uh, he plays music for us live so sebastian you mind taking it away for us a little bit all right, here is Sebastian Messer, everybody, uh, my son, who is in the band Krieger. Thanks a lot, Bess. It was pretty good. So, Maggie, um, let us talk a little bit. Uh, you just recently had a, um, a little success with your book, The Better Spy, didn't you? Yes. Um, I had a um, part three of a series come out back in August, and in between marketing for that, I, I will take one of the books on my back list and feature it. Um, where I do a, a lot of promotion on it, and um, I recently had it free um, for five days, and it actually hit number 13 
on the Amazon um, espionage bestseller list. So I was pretty happy with that. That's cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, book? Yeah, The Better Spy is about a specific mission in the life of one of my pr- protagonists where she goes undercover. What's your pr- protagonist's in- name? Oh, her name is Mai Fisher. Okay. And she's an agent for um, a fictional United Nations um, spy shop. Hmm. And she she goes undercover uh, in the Irish Republican Army. And it happens to be a mission where she's very severely injured, um, essentially what we now call a traumatic brain injury. Hmm, okay. But she... She comes back from it, although with difficulty. She and en- she ends up with PTSD and a brief indulgence with um, illegal narcotics. But she gets through that to return to her um, to her duty. And uh, so it's just kind of an exploration. I uh, I dedicated it to um, people who suffer from PTSD. Hmm. Because I think that's a very important subject that um, you know people need support with, uh, whatever wherever their trauma comes from. Um, there's going to be PTSD if you have severe trauma, and so we we need to be supportive of that as as much as we can. So um, so it's kind of a it, I I did a very interesting thing with it. It's actually told in reverse chronology, so it it starts at present day when I wrote it, which was back in 2013, and then it works its way backwards to the event that injured her. Oh, wow. Okay. That was kind of, yeah, that was kind of an interesting thing to do. It drove me nuts for a while getting it all synced. (laughs) But, uh, but it was, it was an interesting way to do it. And, and I've gotten some good feedback from people on that structure. So I, I guess, (laughs) I guess the hunch played out well. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. What um what got you interested in writing? Um, I don't know. I I've always I mean, I read at a very young age. Mm-hmm. My my grandmother taught me how to read when I was about four and I just devoured everything I could get my hands on. And I guess when I was a teenager, um I started writing what we now call fan fiction. Okay. About what? I've I was a teenager a long time ago, so we didn't call it fan fiction then. What but was the fan about, fiction about? Uh, Star Trek and The Man from Uncle. Oh, okay. Very cool. So, yeah. So The Man from Uncle is probably why I write about spies now, because I, I loved that show. That and the uh, original Avengers with uh, John Steed and Emma Peel. Not, hmm. not the current Marvel Avengers, but the. British TV show called The Avengers. So, yeah, I've seen I've seen that. Um, actually, I saw the. Um, well, I guess it's not new, new, but they had a, an Avengers movie not too long ago with um, Uma Thurman. Yeah, with Uma Thurman, and I forgot the guy who plays John Speed, but mm-hmm. um, some <clears throat> famous British actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell me about that Star Trek fan fiction. Were you a big Star Trek fan? Oh yes, I'm, I watched um, Star Trek from the very first episode. I had to kind of fight with my parents to watch it because they were a, a little dubious of it. Um, I grew up in the countryside of Virginia, so we were a, they were a pretty conservative area, and my parents were very conservative about what we watched on TV. My dad w- had been a sergeant in the U.S. Army, so he kind of controlled his household very efficiently. <laughs> And I've uh, watched Star Trek, the original series, from the very first episode and have probably watched um, watched them every few years. I'll binge watch the entire series again. Um, just loved that show. Always been a science fiction fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't write it very well. <laughs> I've tried, but uh, it's not my com- in my comfort zone to, to write science fiction, but I love reading it, and I, I like a good um, sci-fi show like Star Trek, you know, space exploration and um, meeting new species and so forth. That's my favorite kind of sci-fi. 
Yeah, I um I was a big sci fi fan when I was a kid. I, I read a lot of um Isaac Asimov, um I read a lot of uh Pierce Anthony, he wrote mostly science fantasy. But uh, yes. I yes. I also grew up um watching Star Trek and then the movies and then um I remember when the next gen came out, it was like, Oh my gosh, that was such a big deal. Like uh we I remember sitting down and watching it with my dad and um it was like, oh, wow. So I've always been a next gen fan. I've always liked the original one too. Uh, but I yeah. like, you know, the Star Trek next generation and the movies. Uh, what's your favorite Star Trek movie? Um, let's see. I think my favorite one was the wrath, the wrath, the wrath of, Khan. of Khan. Yeah. I was going to say the wrath of Khan. Yeah. <laughs> because it was, I mean, you know, it kills off my favorite character. Spoiler alert. But mm. <laughs> But he comes back. Spoiler alert! But I, I don't know. It was, it was more like an episode of the old TV show, Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Um, I, I liked it, but it's very ponderous in places. It's a long movie, and it's a, it's a little. I feel it, like I think it thought too much of itself. But I feel but well. I feel like the, the movie, the Star Trek: The Motion Picture was trying to introduce Star Trek to a whole new generation of fans. And then right. Star Trek two, the wrath of Khan was like the movie for the fans. And exactly. Yeah. So exactly. I was like, I don't know. I, I know what you mean because you know, like all the, the, the characters are all, they're not, it's so weird because they, they weren't old in the movie, but they're all older than they were in the series. You know, but when right. you when you look at the time yeah. difference between like the series to the the movie, that's not that much of a difference, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but they they were all so different. It was like the '80s, and you know, it's like well, I guess the late '70s or whatever. But you know, um, I don't know. I think the weirdest one was um, four. <laughs> um, I think that's the one with the whales, right? Do you remember that one? Uh... I'm not a... yeah. The journey, the, the journey home. Yeah, because yeah, it was. Um... It was Ravicon, Search for Spock, and then the Journey. Yeah, that was um, that was another one that was kind of like an episode. Yeah. And but it was, yeah. I mean, it, it was an, an interesting story, and and Leonard Nimoy, who plays Spock, you know, had a lot to do. Well, he directed that film, and he had a lot to do with the story, developing the story, and he had a specific message he wanted to get across with with that movie and i think he succeeded in that but it was it, it a lot of people i remember a lot of people saying well it just didn't seem like star trek yeah so yeah but uh, it was it had a lot of funny moments in it i mean which harkens back to some of the the original series but uh um yeah i i think as as time went on I, I did like a lot of the next generation movies. Most all of the next generation movies, I, I enjoyed a lot. Yeah, I did too. Um, I did too. But particularly the one, um, oh, the one where they go back in time to save the Earth from the Borg mm -hmm. to to have uh, Zephyr Conqueror do his his first warp um, drive experiment. And of course, the name is escaping me right now. <laughs> I, I can't think of it. Either. But I, yeah, but that was—I thought that was one of the best of of the whole genre of Star Trek movies. I thought that was really one of the best. Um, and well, and Patrick Stewart's like an incredible actor. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> have you seen anything with the new uh, the Picard series or whatever? No, that doesn't. I mean, I've seen the trailers. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't start until January 23rd. And um, I do have CBS All Access because I have been watching Star Trek Discovery, which is still growing on me. I'm not quite there yet, but um, uh, hopefully I'll come to enjoy it. But I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to Picard because he he's such an excellent actor and he it was almost like that particular role was was made for him yeah so it'll be good to see him play it again 
Yeah, well, let's do a little station ID real quick here, Maggie. Um, you are listening to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And you're listening to The Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer. And my guest today is Maggie Duncan. Um, you can find her at PA Duncan for her writing and stuff. So, Maggie, um, you do a bit of editing as well, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, uh, that was primarily what I did. I was the editor of a magazine um, for the Federal Aviation Administration mm. for for many years. That's part of the 30 years that I worked for Uncle Sam. I was the editor of uh, their safety magazine for pilots. And um, I, I, I also do fiction editing as well. And uh, in most any genre... I'm not uh, I'm not much of a romance reader, so I don't really like to edit romance. I mean, if it's a good story, I'll edit it, but um, I just don't feel proficient, particularly doing what we call a developmental edit. I'm not as familiar with all the tropes and so forth, the, the format of a, of a typical modern romance. So um, I um, like I, I did one for a person, and I said, "Well, wait a minute. They've only known each other for three days. How could they be in love?" And the writer said, "Well, that's the way it works in a romance." So, mm. <laughs> so but I'll, uh, I'll I've edited fantasy. I've edited um, uh, science fiction. I, I think you had uh, Carol James Marshall on a few weeks ago, and I've edited a couple of her books. Um, and uh, it's it's just fun. I'm kind of a grammar Nazi, so hmm. it's kind of fun to do some editing. <laughs> yeah, I just started cutting my teeth on uh, <clears throat> editing as well for fiction because uh, I I write for the Savannah Moore News, do Savannah, and uh, I'm not an editor with them, but I do a lot of self editing, and then I've also done a lot of like uh, copywriting work for small businesses oh, right. and stuff. So um, yeah. I am putting together an anthology, a horror anthology, uh, for next spring. And so I'm cutting my teeth on uh, doing some uh, professional editing that way. I uh, I just finished up. I did the NaNoWriMo this last month. And yeah. uh, I finished up uh, my next novel for my uh, Blood Thrasher, The Devils in the Metal. The next one's called... Uh, blood thrasher uh vinyl all night so it's a it's a <clears throat> vampire um horror novel series the savannah wow. vampire no- mm-hmm. novel series but it's kind of interesting um i actually like reading a lot of uh non-fiction stuff on leadership and uh self-development and you know uh, that mm-hmm. kind of thing but i came across um a, an author it was kind of strange but i came across an author called uh george's i'm not sure if you're, i'm saying it right but Simonon. Um, he's a French writer and, or oh, no, yeah. I'm sorry, not French. He's a Belgian writer and he wrote right. like a ton of novels and short stories. Um, but he, um, he created a character uh, called detective, uh, Jules Magret. I, I'm not, I don't know French, so I'm not probably not saying it correctly. Yeah. But, uh, Magret. Uh, yeah. Magret. I yeah. think you're talking about. Yes. I know who you mean now. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was kind of strange because, uh, I was out and about, and the Dollar Tree, I was in there. We we stop off and get snacks and stuff like that for the kids sometimes, and we'll go in there. They want to go in there because sometimes the Dollar Tree will have, like, some off-the-wall stuff that you wouldn't get at Walmart or Kroger or whatever, and they have a little book section. And so, you know, I, I'm kind of a, a bibliophile. I, love, <laughs> I just love to look at books, and I love reading. So, And I came across this um, uh and – I'm not even sure I'm, I'm saying that right. Simonon, Simonon. I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, I came across one of his books there, and it was just a little mystery book, and you know they had him for like a dollar. So I was like, oh yeah, I'll just pick this up or whatever. And uh, I think it's called The Madman of Madrid. And um, so we go next door to the Goodwill. There's like a uh, out in Richmond Hill. There's like a little you know shopping plaza. We go next door to the Goodwill, and I found one of the books, one of his books over there too. So I've been reading that, but uh, I like um, I like thrillers. I like uh, suspense, 
you know, like, um, especially like with movies and stuff, I like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of weird. I like horror. I like that kind of thing. I guess it's all, you know, to me, um, reading up and finding out about horror, it's a lot like romance that romance can have like every genre under its umbrella. Horror is the right. same way. They can have right. every, like, you know, you can have sci-fi horror, you can have Westerns, you can have any genre you want to have really. Um, but it has that branch of it. And, uh, but I've always liked, I've always liked those kind of books. When I was a kid, I used to read a lot of Louis L'Amour, um, uh, Westerns and stuff like that. And read a lot of sci-fi and that kind of thing. So I didn't really do any fan fiction writing though. I never, I never got into fan fiction writing. Um, never really got into fiction writing until uh, just recently, but I've written a lot mm-hmm. for like business and, um, academic, uh, especially when I was doing my undergrad and my master's and, you know, so I like to write, yeah. but yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, for, for the most part of the 30 years I worked for the government, that was all nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, some of it highly technical. Some of it, I, I, I was given the assignment of taking all of the guidance material for aviation safety inspectors and putting it in a digital format and then making sure that it was written in what we call plain language. Mm-hmm. And um, that was, yeah, that was quite the editing job because it, it was written in very typical bureaucratic language. If you've ever read any federal regulations, you know, they're all written by lawyers, first of all. Yeah. So they're very obtuse. And, yeah. Non committal, uh, oblong. Right. Obtuse language. So having to language. take that and translate it into to something, you know, because we would have. Plenty of room for loopholes. We would have inspectors who had a great deal of experience in the aviation industry, and then we would have inspectors who were brand new to the aviation industry. And we mm-hmm. had to hit that kind of medium road that everybody could could travel, and that that was quite a challenge. Yeah, I yeah. do still like to edit nonfiction. I have edited a couple of pieces of of nonfiction for folks. So I I have a degree in history, mm. and um, so. I had to write a lot of papers when I was in college. Actually, I had a double major in history and political science. So I, the last two years of college, I did nothing but write papers. Oh, I know. <laughs> and, uh, I know. It's, I, a, it's such a grind. It, when I did uh, my undergrad, it was the same thing. And then uh, doing the master's, and I did an MBA, and I did a master of information systems. Mm-hmm. So the information right. system side was very technical, very dry. Um, the business side yeah. of it, you know, doing that, it's a lot of analytical, you know, thinking and yeah. like, okay, yeah. well, you know, how do we take this idea and actually make it functional? So, yeah, it's yeah. a totally different beast with uh, fiction writing, though. I mean, it's... It is. I, I enjoy fiction writing so much more because I can just kind of, you know, when you write nonfiction, you, if, if you come across an interesting way to phrase something... Mm-hmm. You have to stop and say, well, you know, maybe this isn't the right way to say it. But in fiction, you know, you're kind of given a little more free reign to to make your language much more rich and descriptive, I think. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's yeah. one aspect I enjoy about it. So. I, I'm a little funny about that, too. Um, I don't like um, I don't like fiction that has too much. um I like stuff that's concise. I like stuff that, you yes. know, I don't, I, I don't enjoy the, the writers that write, he did this and 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 this. And then he did that and that and right. that and that and that. I, I don't enjoy that at all. You know, I like a lot of, uh, I like action. I, I like the descriptors, but also I feel like, you know, if you were to say, okay, uh, you know, um, John was six foot tall, weighed 200, 35 pounds had brown hair brown eyes tan skin very muscular um you know and his hands were rough uh wore you know plaid shirt with you know dark denim jeans and worker you know working boots you know steel toe boots you know though i don't know i think sometimes it's a little bit too much you know and i think some i think that's something that people do sometimes uh, yeah. Versus, you know, yeah. saying like John's tall, you know, with a muscular build and dark hair and dark eyes, you know, it leaves a little bit more to the imagination, you know? Yeah. I've, I've found the more I, um, the more I write, the, the, 
the better I've come at, you know, giving a person a vague description of a character, but so that they can fill in and get a better picture themselves of, of what the character looks like to them. And, you know, you can do that by using a lot of similes and metaphors. You know, he was built like a linebacker. Mm-hmm. That, you know, something like that will tell you right away what that person looks like. Yeah. So, my my, my yeah, first novella. Just, go ahead. It just it just comes with practice. You know, yeah. My first so. novella, I didn't I didn't describe the characters what they look like at all. <laughs> I did that on purpose yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I was like, you know, yeah. whatever that character is in your mind, <laughs> you know, uh, I was descriptive about, you know, the way they felt and how they acted, but not about the way they looked. And um, it was funny because I had one I, I had different reviews um, with it, which was kind of neat. But uh, one of the reviews said that they would have liked some kind of description <laughs> for the characters. And I was like, oh, yeah. you know, OK, yeah. Um, yeah. we, we've got to take a little bit, a uh, little break here. Uh, Maggie, um, do you mind hanging on the phone with okay. us for this next half an hour? Sure. All right. Thanks. All right. Sebastian, do you mind uh, playing a little bit for us? Everybody, this is Sebastian Messer and, uh, his band is called Krieger. It's a, what a death thrash metal band. Yeah. 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 So here it is. <laughs> Michael Landra in a Celtic Yuletide show featuring Irish holiday songs. The Center for Irish Research and Teaching at Georgia Southern University will present Wexford tenor Michael Landra in a Celtic Yuletide show featuring Irish holiday songs. The event will take place on Thursday, December 19th at 7.30 p.m. at the Fine Arts Auditorium on the Armstrong Campus in Savannah. More information is available at irishgeorgia.com. WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. WRUU 107.5 FM is a new and different listener-supported and all-volunteer community radio station for Savannah. Our diverse broadcast and web programming is supported by generous listeners, who value our passion and spunk. We are independent of other media and receive no government or large corporate support. People like you are our largest and most important source of our funding. Go to WRUU.org to find out how you can make a one-time or a monthly contribution. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, we are back. This is the Adam Messer Show, and you're listening to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And my special guest today is <clears throat> Maggie Duncan, um, a.k.a. P.A. Duncan. And uh, Maggie, you are a um, kind of like a espionage spy thriller type writer, right? You there, Maggie? Can you hear me, Maggie? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, well, I couldn't hear you there at first. Um, <clears throat> so, did, were you able to hear my question? Yes, uh, yes, I write um, esp- what I call realistic espionage fiction, mm-hmm. kind of like um, John le Carré, uh, who who writes about the British Secret Service because he used to work for them when uh, under his real name. And uh, so that means that there aren't a lot of car chases and there's not a lot of shootouts. But there's action, but it's more like what a real spy encounters. It's, it's not like James Bond movies or Jason Bourne movies. It's it shows all aspects of espionage from the information collecting to the analysis and hmm. um, how, how spies actually recruit people and manipulate people to do uh, what they want. So you know, but it's also, it's, it's also good when you're really, really angry with somebody, <laughs> you can just write them into a story and kill them off. <laughs> Yeah, um, I I haven't done that one yet, but um, you know I'm listening to uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, newest book called Talking with Strangers, and Mm -hmm. um, he was talking about um, there. I guess in Cuba there there was a big uh, scandal. I'm trying to think when it was. Um, I think the lady uh, was caught in the mid 2000s, but. she was a double agent. She worked for the um, the U.S. in espionage, and then she was a double agent. And it turned out like like almost all of these different agents that they had, um, these Cuban agents for the U.S. were all double agents for Cuba. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, I think um, you know the most recent example of that is uh, the the woman. Russian spy who um, was arrested a couple of years ago and put on trial and and I think she served her 18 months and um, has been deported back to Russia but but her story is, is fairly typical you know they're they're sent over as something else right you know, she she was sent over here as a lobbyist essentially for a, you know particular groups in the country and uh, she made friends with a lot of politicians and um but what she was doing was i mean she had an agenda from you know the russian intelligence services to 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 work over here and she got caught that's called rolling up and she got captured that's called rolling up um and uh, i kind of thought actually they would exchange her for you know, somebody the Russians had in custody, but they went ahead and put her on trial, and uh, she served her time, and um, she's back in Russia now. I'm, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see if um, she survives, <laughs> mm. <laughs> because, uh, you know, she got caught, mm. and uh, the uh, uh, any intelligence service doesn't like it when their operatives get caught, but... Um, they're not quite as extreme. Some of them are not quite as extreme as the Russians are, but the Russians don't like failure, and that's been true since they, you know, since the KGB or the NKVD before that. Uh, they they don't take failure very lightly. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, when you're writing, <clears throat> can you talk about like what you did um, in the government? I mean, not like particulars, well, but can you talk about you know like stuff that you, what your role was or. Besides the, yeah, I know you were an editor, but um, was that yeah. was that main your main role was the publication or? Well, that was the, in the first part of my career. The the second, more or less, half of my career, I was uh, 
a person that was given special projects and special investigations to conduct. Okay. Um, um, I also did a lot of uh, whistleblower complaint investigations. That was one of my things. Um, and uh, yeah. and I, I actually, not for an airline whistleblower complaint because they have their own process, but I, I investigated the complaints that our own employees um, filed under the whistleblower law. Mm. And um, then I was, um, I was, uh, I was picked to kind of be after 9/11. You know, there was a lot of information that needed to be collected and provided to various government agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the associate administrators in the Federal Aviation Administration picked me to be that person. So whenever a congressional committee or the FBI wanted a specific question answered, the question came to me. I prepared the response, uh, determined whether it had to be classified or not, and then routed it back up through the hierarchy to, uh, to go back to Congress or go back to uh, uh, the FBI. Uh, one of the things I did was, um, you know, the hijackers from 9-11, uh, from a lot of them were um, certified pilots uh, certificated here in the United States, and I kept their airman files in a box at my feet for the better part of, let's see, that happened in 2001. I retired from 2001. For the better part of eight years, um, I had everything we knew about them from an aviation aspect in a box at my feet so that when I got a question from uh, Congress or the FBI, I could access that and and prepare the answer. Hmm. Um, so... You think that had an influence on wanting to write about um, spies and that kind of thing? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because I was on a couple of different task forces mm -hmm. with, you know, with, with people from the CIA who would only give you their first name. <laughs> And you were never certain that that was their real name. Yeah. And we would, and, and, you know, during breaks, we would talk about stuff. And, and I said to one of them one time, I said, you know, I'd really like to write espionage fiction. And he said, well, just get it right. You know, and he said, we're not James Bond. Uh, we're not Jason Bourne. So mm -hmm. get it right. And so one of them is still a person I go to today. When I have a question about, you know, would a spy do this or do that, I can go to this person and, and get an answer. Okay. It's kind of yeah. neat. You have firsthand uh, research available right there. Yeah. That person. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, so I learned a lot as well because, you know, I've, I've read all of Ian Fleming's books and I've seen all the James Bond movies. So it was kind of, in a way, it was kind of disappointing that that, that, that wasn't reality. But in, in a way, the reality is more fascinating because um, uh, they have to rely more on their brains mm -hmm. than on a gun or uh, seducing a woman or a man or something like that. It, it's really all, you know, working from instinct and um, retraining your way of thinking. I mean, you you end up being a little paranoid, um, but it, that could, you know save your life at some point and uh i mean it, it can be it can be dangerous but um um there's a there's a saying in aviation that flying is like hours and hours of sheer boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror hmm. and espionage is somewhat the same way um you have days and weeks and months of nothing happens and then all of a sudden, it all goes downhill. <laughs> oh wow! So you have to be you have to be prepared for for both types of situations. But I, I've I've actually had people ask me if I was a spy, and I usually joke with them and say, "Well, now I couldn't tell you now, could I?" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So what um, what is it like uh, with your editing services? What do you what do you enjoy doing with that? Is that is that something that you do as a an outlet 
uh, for your writing, or is it just something that you do because you used to do it with the aviation um, technical writing and stuff like that? Well, um, I'm I, I'm very much a believer in uh, independent authors or you know self published authors, and that sometimes has a stigma attached to it, particularly when the self published author doesn't bother to have professional editing mm-hmm. and and i've i've read some things you know i've i'll look at a free book on amazon and say well that sounds interesting i'll download it and i did that one time and i found you know like 30 grammatical errors in the first two paragraphs oh wow and and that's frustrating to me and and i can understand why bookstores and other places don't want to support um, independent authors or self-published authors when what they're putting out is, um, you know, something that's poorly written and poorly edited. So I started doing editing to help mostly independent authors uh, get a pro- get out a product that people will want to pick up and read. Um, that, in, in other words, that it looks as much like a book published by Macmillan or uh, Penguin House or Random House or Mm -hmm. Simon & Schuster, then it does, you know, oh, look, I wrote my NaNoWriMo project. And and, and I've heard, I've had people say this to me. Oh, I wrote this in November. I, I edited it in December and I published it in January. Well, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is something to self-editing. Self-editing can be done, but that pair of eyes on something that you write, a pair of eyes that haven't read it before, that's invaluable to an independent author. Because even with me, I mean, I send my, I mean, 30-some years experience as an editor, and I still send my work out to be edited. Because there are things I'm going to miss, um, and and my editor finds them all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, none and of it, us are perfect. And it's not, yeah, it's not just typos. It's like, well, now you have this character say this on page six, but on page 122, he said this, and they contradict each other. Right. <clears throat> so that's that's the major aspect of it for me is, is catching those kinds of of errors that make you look like an amateur. And I really want to elevate the status of, of people who opt to independently publish themselves because, frankly, it's difficult to get published by a traditional printing house or, or publisher now. I mean, it's just difficult. They're only going to invest in you if if they think your story is the best in the whole wide world. And there are a lot of good stories out there written by people that that a publisher won't think are commercially viable. And, and I think that's a shame, and I'm glad that, that there are avenues for people to publish their work. But if you're, if you're going to do that, make it something you could be proud of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, you should – work on your craft and you should do the uh things what do you say to those folks because um they're well you know this there's a phrase that i I like to use it's called shovels and jeans and uh kind of refers back to um the gold rush days you know the most of the folks that went out there um trying to strike it rich you know hitting the big mother load um they didn't make it rich the folks that set up shop and sold shovels and jeans were the ones that you know (laughs) profited and made it you know uh, I mean, right. Sears catalog exactly. was a big, you know, they, they made a lot of money because they had a catalog and they could ship stuff to people, you know, um, exactly. but exactly. shovels and jeans, um, there are a lot, and I've got to do a, a station ID real quick. Um, cause we're at the quarter hour and we've got about 10 more minutes or so, but, uh, du- well, you're listening to WRU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Sounding's community radio with global soul. So, um, I heard your perspective about, um, uh, the editing and, uh, I think that's a, a good, um, a good rule of thumb, uh, you know, have your work looked at or whatever. Now, 
what do you think about when I'm talking about shovels and jeans? There are a lot of folks out there that try to sell services um, yes. to folks. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, you're not a pushy kind of, you know, editor. And you know, I don't think I've ever even seen right. anything about your editing services other than, you know, I knew about it because of Carol. Um, yeah. But what do you think about those folks? Because there's a ton of it out there. Um, you know, it seems like there's a whole micro industry inside of the self-publishing industry of people trying to say, hey, buy my program and you'll be the next best selling indie author or buy my, yeah. you know, this or buy my that. And you, you know, you follow these 10 steps and, you know, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I think as with anything, you have to examine them carefully. I mean, if, if, if I'm going to go on Amazon and buy any product, not, not just a book, but any product, I'm going to read the reviews. I'm going to read, you know, what people said when they got it. Did it work the way it said? And then whatever company makes that, that product, I'm going to go look them up mm-hmm. on, you know, I'm going to Google them and I'm going to find out if they have any consumer complaints and, and so forth. I think you have to be very careful about, like, because the Facebook ads pop up for me all the time because yeah, I yeah. have a, a Facebook author page. And I'm always getting these ads for, you know, yes, try my program, try mm-hmm. this. And I go in and look at it, and it's not really for me because I know grammar and I know, um, I know how to research. But I also recognize that there are people who, who don't know how to do that. I, I was talking with a person i'm a member of a couple of online facebook writer groups Mm -hmm. and this one one person several months ago was complaining about her her formatter you know she didn't like the way the formatter did something Mm -hmm. and well it turns out that that the formatter doesn't really i mean that's not her main job she just did it for this person as, as a favor, but charged her for it. Mm-hmm. And then the other she, thing she was complaining about was, well, the person I hired to upload my book to Amazon. And I said, why did you hire someone to upload your book to Amazon when you can go to a- KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, mm-hmm. yourself, and they walk you through it step mm-hmm. by step? Right. So I think there are people out there who – try to make it look like it's way more complicated than it is and that you need them to to do this for you. You don't need anybody to upload a document to 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 anybody who publishes ebooks whether it's KDP or Smashwords or Draft to Digital or any of those others, uh, even iBooks, you know. It they they've made it as easy as possible to do. Yeah. So when, when somebody approaches you and says, well, you know, you need me to, to format for you. Now, I used to have trouble formatting manuscripts for Kindle. Mm-hmm. And I used to pay somebody $100 a manuscript to, to take, take my manuscript and get it ready for Kindle. Mm-hmm. And then I, then I purchased uh, a program called Vellum. Now it was expensive. It was two hundred and forty nine dollars. I've been but looking I, into Vellum, but I have an iPad and I don't have a Mac, so it's not available on an iPad. Uh, but uh, yeah, right, I've been looking into um, like the next computer that I get is probably going to be a Mac, just because of Vellum and being able to use that. But I, yeah, I, yeah that that the that, that's to me that's an investment. I want to read something to you, Maggie. Um, talking okay. about the same thing. I have a Twitter account, and uh, so it's kind of ironic that you said, you know, <laughs> doing the nano and then uh, editing and then publishing, because that's exactly what I'm doing with my next book. Um, but I have a lot more experience than other people, so I feel pretty confident about yeah. my writing and stuff like that. Yeah. But I would not recommend yeah. it to a brand new writer, because it's not, like you said, that's not really how it goes. Um, but yeah, I definitely have other people that are going to read it before I send it, you know, hit that publish. Um, sure. but here we go. Sure. All right. So I have a Twitter thing and I, I was sharing the nano rhymo thing 
Um, and I get a message from a, a, a page, and I'm not going to name any names here, but I just want to read this to you. It says, Adam, not sure how much you like to use Twitter for your marketing for your books, but I know publishers and agents strongly recommend a very capitalized, all very large following, minimum of twenty to 30,000 followers for authors. Now, I have, I think, over 2,200 authors, or not authors, I have over 2,200 followers on Twitter. I've been on Twitter since like yeah. 2008. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not whatever. It's not that big of a, a, a thing, but whatever it says, I help authors grow real followers, real followers is all caps again, rapidly and develop a strong Twitter account. Email me at blank, blank, blank. If you're interested and slash or have any questions. Thanks. Yeah. And I said, I get that, those all the time too. <laughs> I said, that, I said, that is interesting. Tell me more. And it says, if you send me an email address, I can send you more info. I said, hmm, sounds like a sales pitch. Thanks anyway. Yeah. Person writes back, yeah. of course it's a, quote, sales pitch, quote. You act as if that's a bad thing, ellipsis. Most of American business is based on someone offering a service, dash, dash, selling, dash, dash, and then providing that service with high quality, period. That is exactly what I do, period, and have built accounts for hundreds of actors, comma, writers, comma, businesses, ellipsis, etc. And I said, that's interesting. What makes you say that? <laughs> and he goes, say which? I said a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, that's the shovels and jeans thing that I'm, I'm talking about because, you know, there, <clears throat> I, I do agree that you you should invest into, like, you know, Vellum or something like that. You should invest into tools and services that will help you with your product. But I'll give you an example. You know, um, like that first novelette, uh, blood thresher the devil's in the metal i did everything myself uh i've you know published it you know um had paperback copies or whatever i've sold about 60 copies since last year since last august um mm-hmm. my new poetry book I, I the when we did the uh thing at east shavers i sold out that day sold 10 copies and then they sold out again which was another two copies and i had 10 digital copies online sold and I think I've sold maybe mm. I think I've sold maybe twenty five books copies of that, and that was this August. So yeah. you know, and I don't do advertisements, and I don't you know I don't do any of that stuff. Um, so you know, when you're investing in that, and I was uh, uh, recently part of Rachel Brune's, um anthology that just came out called uh, Stories We Tell After Midnight, and that was mm-hmm. a pay uh, that was a, a pay uh, paid story, you know, where she paid me for the story. And, right. uh, but I told her, I said, you know, I would, I would much rather, you know, take the money that you're paying and, and advertise the, you know, the book or whatever. And I think she had, I think she had like almost a hundred pre pre orders because there's like, I think 13 or 14 authors in the anthology. And so collectively there were like maybe a hundred pre orders or something like that. Now, mm-hmm. you know, the new pre order that I have, it hit number 10. And I think it actually hit a higher number than that because, um, it only I've only had two pre-orders with it, only two pre-orders. But on Amazon, it hit you know that, and I was looking up like some statistics, and it was saying something about uh, you know, maybe close to seventy five hundred new books every day, right? Oh yeah. And yeah. so you know you're out there, you're like this, you know, you're like this ding in the universe, and you're like ding, and you put it yeah. out there, and you know whatever, and um, but the better the story, you know, I always tell folks. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many you sell. It doesn't matter, you know, how many people know who you are. It doesn't matter, whatever. If you have a good story, the good, you know, that story will promote itself, you know, because right. people love right. to talk about a good, good story. story. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They love to talk about a good story. And so, you know, I'm not famous. Uh, you know, you're not famous. We're not famous writers. It doesn't, that doesn't no. matter. It just, you know, I agree with that. Uh, the shovels and jeans thing. It's like, Oh, don't, don't, you know, don't, don't just buy a service because whatever. You still have to have a good story. That's the basis of it. You have to have a good story, yeah. and then you do those other yeah. things to polish it up and you know to make it you know better. You know, so yeah. As, as we say, where where I come from, you cannot put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> yeah, I still got a pig. Well, Maggie, so <laughs> much, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, where can people check out your stuff and uh, check out your books? Uh, you can find them on Amazon um, under P.A. Duncan or Phyllis A. Duncan. I 
had a little fight with Amazon because a couple of books I used my my whole name, which is Phyllis, my the name that I hate. And then after that, I switched to P.A. Duncan, mainly because I hate my first name. Um, so you can find them find them under uh, under either. And then um, uh, you know, if you want to go read more about them before you, if you think you might be interested, uh, you can go to my website, which is www unexpectedpaths.com unexpectedpaths.com mm-hmm. and are you still running that promo for that one book or is it over uh, it's over I only ran it for five days oh okay um, okay but there's a new one that, <laughs> that, that I'm promoing in December it's actually a novella oh, okay called cool. uh, The Yellow Scarf and it's 99 cents for the month of December um and probably right around Christmas, I'll have I'll have that for free for people who want last minute gifts or whatever. And it's a it's a story about uh, the Balkan Civil War, specifically about um, the sniper activity in Sarajevo, Sarajevo, Yugoslavia, in the early 1990s. All right, Maggie. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for having me. It was much appreciated, and it was. Uh, fun to chat about star trek that was kind of my favorite part (laughs) (laughs) yeah me too all right everybody uh stay tuned because at the four o'clock hour we have michael Sorensen on uh if you remember i interviewed him about his new book called i hear you and he's going to be on talking about his new podcast um that he's he's got that he just started up so uh this last hour you've been listening to wruulp savannah georgia 107.5 fm